to talk. <laughs> uh, it's a long way away from you. Well, here, we'll turn it a little bit sideways and we'll yeah. okay. uh, hold yeah. it. Move yeah, the plant. Move 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 the plant. We know one event at Christmas. Tell us about another Christmas that wasn't perhaps as grotesque or that might have been, uh, that might have been more fun. Well, actually, uh, we had a Christmas in New York, in Bedford Village, uh, New York, where we, we had a house for reasons that I have absolutely no idea. And um, we, had, we had a parade of uncles uh, come through. New York newspaper man who brought a dead pheasant, which I never understood, but I had to say thank you for. And then came Greg Bouncer, and he was uh, he was a law lawyer. He worked for a very famous uh, law firm, and he was one of the most handsome and popular gigolos of Los Angeles. He and the newspaper man with the pheasant did not meet. <laughs> but we met all of them, and uh, it was quite a trick to make sure that we didn't say anything about the dead pheasant to the lawyer. <laughs> then we did a little play which we had rehearsed, and I'm sure it was absolutely terrible because I kept forgetting my lines. But we had a wonderful time. We had snow that year, and we built an igloo, my brother and I, and I put him in it, and it fell down. <laughs> they accused me of trying to bury my brother. But, um, family violence has many ramifications. <laughs> But the play went off, and we had a wonderful time, and uh, we, we performed our duties very well. <laughs> well, you know, speaking of uncles, my father directed your mother in a play, and he had a firm and fast rule that he never slept with an actress that he was directing. And yet, with Joan Crawford, he didn't have a choice, because he said that she <laughs> treated sex just like a man. And it was like he was expected, if he was going to direct the movie, to sleep with her. And on the last day of shooting, she gave him a pair of cufflinks, said goodbye, and he never saw her again. But he did go to dinner one night and noticed that there were five men around this table all wearing the same cufflinks. So you had a number of uncles, and you made drinks for all of them. Oh, yes. I, uh, I was, that was my job. I was to go downstairs and open the front door when the doorbell rang, and my mother was never ready. Uh, she only had on some of her underwear. <laughs> so I went down, I opened the front door, and my job was, and I was eight, nine years old, my job was to uh, entertain the gentleman, take him into the bar, fix him whatever drink he would like, and I fixed the stiffest drinks in the world. And I kind of enjoyed seeing what happened very quickly afterwards. And then I would take the gentleman upstairs to my mother's dressing room um, where she would proceed to continue getting dressed in front of him. And then I left because at that time they would tell jokes that they wore with laughter at and I had no idea what it meant and I always felt very embarrassed so the best thing for me to do was to leave. 
But one time when I was told to do this, I was told that uh, the, the caller was uh, a Mr. Brenner and uh, Brenner, and I went down to the, to the door and it was, oh, I don't know, five, six, seven o'clock in the evening, so it was still quite light. And I opened the door and there was a bald-headed gypsy man naked to the waist with pantaloons on. <laughs> I slammed the door in his face, <laughs> ran upstairs and told my mother to call the police. <laughs> and she said, oh, that's Yul Brynner, and he's doing King and I, he must have come right from the studio. And so I was told to march myself down, open the door, apologize to the gentleman, and fix this bald-headed gypsy man with the big pants, um, a very stiff drink. <laughs> And you didn't listen in upstairs to find out what happened as your no. did your mother continued dressing and he continued undressing? Or? I have no idea. He was almost undressed anyway. And uh, she was only half dressed and I thought the best thing to do was to leave quickly. Well, while we're on the subject of sex, um, one of the uh, audience questions we had um, was, did you ever make it to second base with the kid in camp? Oh. He was so handsome. Um, he was a lot older than I, and he got expelled from school. But that's life. Don't you find it interesting, really, when you think about it, the hypocrisy that was involved in your mother's response to what was harmless, given her behavior? I mean, what did she expect you to learn, well, if not from watching her? Right, but I, I think looking back on, on that, I was so hungry for normal love and affection, just the kind of thing that kids basically take for granted. A hug, a pat, an encouragement, uh, you know, a, a kiss on the forehead, good night, that I, I was literally starved for love and affection, and I think that's what prompted me. You know, you are well known for not really liking the movie. And why, what is it in particular about the movie that you don't like? Is it the general depiction of it? Is it the overall phoniness of it? Is it the over-the-top quality uh, pay? Um, is it the way they sort of have taken your life and turned it into burlesque? I mean, but... is really what bothers you about the film. Well, I think you've detailed all of it. <laughs> but I'd like to say one thing I like. The makeup. <laughs> really? I think the makeup artist did a fabulous job. Okay. <laughs> all of them watch the makeup. I well, your mother, you would know that better than I. I thought the makeup was a little exaggerated, but then her makeup was kind of exaggerated. Yes, actually, in the, um, in the 20th anniversary edition of, of Mommy Dearest, which I have here tonight for the first time anywhere, I, I have a picture uh, in the book of me trying to dress up like Joan Crawford. <laughs> And it's the only time I ever did it. I, I, I was not as successful as the ladies up here tonight. <laughs> but in those times, which was actually a time when she went to uh, volunteer at the Hollywood Canteen and entertain the troops, uh, <laughs> I would get to choose an outfit from her closet, uh, not some of the good stuff, but the everyday things. And um, this picture, I have to laugh. I have, she, she would make me up, and of course I'm very fair, and she would put the eyebrows on me. Well, I cannot tell you what I looked like at 10 years old with that. I mean, Groucho Marx is kind. <laughs> 
wore the ankle strap shoes, nearly killed myself trying to walk in them, and I have a belt on that says Joan, and there I am standing there posing for one of the fans, and somehow that snapshot survived, and it's in the book, so it was, uh, you know, it was one of those silly, fun things. A great segue into the book. This, by the way, is the new edition of the book. And for any of you who have read, you know, the amazing thing, the first edition of this book I read sold 700,000 copies in hardcover and over 3 million copies in paperback, which means more people, and this is amazing, read the book than probably ever saw the movie. And that's quite a testament to your book. And this new one is remarkable for those of you who are listening in, uh, because it is filled with things that were cut out of the first one, as we anybody who's written a book knows the editors love to do. Shorter is better. I guess they pay by the word. Um, at any rate, it is, makes this a much more complex the rendition is the wrong word, but complex description of what was a very complex life and one that doesn't lend itself to, to facile, you know, comments. I mean, you could say that it was horrible and I'm sure there's some people who would say, in spite of what you've written here, that it was wonderful. You wrote in here, it is a very moving scene when you go to see her after she's died. And you're the only one who wants to go and ask her to see the body. And you look at her, and you describe a great sense of relief that she is really dead. This is just not a Hollywood stunt. She's not going to come back and get even with you. Uh, and yet, you also said to her, corpse, body, that I loved you. And I do love you. And you forgive, forgave her. Did that stick? Did after that final jab, when she turns around and sort of leaves you with the legacy of a mystery of why she's disinherited you, and which is just going to eat at your brain for the rest of your life, did you finally say, you know, I've just had enough of these games with this woman, and say, you know, no, I don't forgive you anymore, or do you still forgive? Her? Oh, that took place a long time ago, and I don't think I could have continued to live my life and get healthy and well and have a life if I hadn't continued to work to make sure that that held. that I found in the book, there's, uh, and this was not in the first book at all, is a letter that Christina wrote to her mother um, shortly before she died, I believe, a couple of years. And there's one passage in it that I wanted Christina to read to you this evening because I thought it was especially moving. This uh, was a letter that I wrote because I couldn't seem to communicate my adult feelings in any other way. And it's, it's quite long, and as Eric said, it was not included in the original uh, version, although it was in the original manuscript, which this book is taken from. It, it, it was that kind of a letter that some people write to their parents in order to get it straight with them as an adult, to have them understand them as an adult, and a lot of people never sent. This letter was sent. It took me days to write it and, and rewrite it. It was not returned, and it was never acknowledged. But this is the passage. I remember the walks by the seawall in Carmel, mothers. I remember the poetry. I remember moments of genuine caring. That is why I guess I tried so hard. Because underneath that angry, sadistic, insecure bitch, there was a woman who was searching 
and struggling with her soul's journey and capable of giving and receiving a great deal of love. That is the person I loved, wanted to be loved by, and feel close to. That's just a wonderful passage. Uh, we have a couple questions, uh, more questions from the audience. One from um, Philip Ford is, what has happened to your brother Christopher? My brother Chris uh, is married, has a family, works, uh, and uh, is a very, very, very private person. He served in uh, Vietnam, he was wounded twice, and he came back and uh, went to the east to a small village that he knew some people from his childhood, and he has remained there ever since. We are very, very, very close. I live in Idaho now on a 160-acre farm, run a bed and breakfast, and uh, a restaurant. And my brother came the first year I was there to help me build my new house. And uh, a year and a half later, he came and helped me build my woodshed. And this year, he, he came out and we went fishing. <laughs> uh, which is a great segue to the fact that you have cattle on your farm or on your ranch, and one of the funniest stories you told me on the phone when you called and you agreed to do this. Um, well, you know the story I'm talking about, so I'll let you tell it. Okay. Well, the first part of this is uh, actually in the book. I was a very tiny little girl, maybe two, three years old, and we went to, Mother and I, and the little uh, dachshund dog, went to New York, upstate New York, to friends of hers that owned a, a dairy farm and were friends of hers from Christian science. Uh, first my mother was a Catholic, then she was a Christian scientist, and then I don't know what happened. Uh, but in those days she was a Christian scientist and we were visiting this, this farm, this dairy farm, and my mother was very uh, athletic and outdoorsy in those days, for which I am extremely grateful, because we went and took a walk in a beautiful pasture, and uh, all of a sudden we heard a noise, and I looked around to see where the noise came from, and very close to us was a gigantic dairy bull. We had ended up in the bull's pasture. My mother screamed, picked me up and kind of threw me over her shoulder and started running for the fence and, and uh, uh, screaming at the top of her lungs for her Christian science friends. I, being thrown over her shoulder, had the rear view picture definitely catching us, and the dog disappearing as it jumped, running for its life in the tall grass. I could not see where we were going, I could just see what was coming after us. And her friends heard the screams, and the woman came out of the house and, and evidently was right by the fence, shouting, Remember, Joan, God is love. My mother yelled back, God is love on the other side of the fence. Okay, fast forward 50 years, and I live in Idaho on a farm, and I pasture cattle, and it was uh, getting to be a winter, and the cattle needed to be moved. And it was a very, very cold day, and I was helping the man that owned the cattle move the cattle through the loading chutes into the truck, and it was getting cold, and it was dark, and it was starting to snow, and I was freezing to death. And the only animal that was not yet on the truck, it was the last animal, was a two-year-old black bull. 
which I stayed quite clear of, and let him, uh, the cattleman, do the work. Well, the bull was not going to go up that ramp and onto the truck. The cattleman did everything. He rang his tail, and he tried to kick it and push it, pull it, nothing was happening. And he was getting disgusted, he was swearing, and it was really cold. And because I had been helping move the cattle, I had a stick in my hand. So although the cattleman had his back turned to me, I walked up behind the bull and whacked that bull in the balls with the stick. That bull shot up that ramp onto the truck. She had to have the set very, very cold as she had a complex about heat. And I think she just had ongoing menopause. I don't know what happened. <laughs> well, her co-stars who were... Um, her and apartment was that way also in New York. It was so cold, I couldn't believe it. I all, even in the summertime, well, particularly in the summertime, I, had, I brought sweaters and jackets, and in the wintertime, I never, sometimes took my jacket, I'd take my coat off, but I wouldn't take my jacket off, and then you had to take your shoes off, so your feet froze, and... Because you couldn't get the white carpet dirty. Well, there wasn't a carpet, so you were in constant danger of slipping and breaking your neck, and in fact, several people did that. I don't know why she didn't get sued, but... Well, maybe she just settled. And then there were people that had holes in their socks, and they were really embarrassed. Well, I know that you know, in this movie with my father, that Henry Fonda and Dana Andrews, who were the co-stars, complained about the temperature. And the next day, she bought him a pair of long underwear and said, quit complaining. <laughs> <laughs> um, when Franco Zeffirelli was supposed to be the director on this film originally? Yes. Do you ever look back and say, oh, God, I wish you'd done it? Yes, I think Franco is a, is a brilliant director. I, I, I met him at a friend's house when he was considering uh, doing the film, and his idea of the film was to do it sort of like a diva picture, like Maria Callas. So uh, he, he obviously changed his mind, but I think the, the, the greatest loss for me personally was that Anne Bancroft was supposed to do the lead, and I met and spoke with Anne, and she would have, well, it definitely would not have been the picture that you all love. But, <laughs> but I might have liked it better. We'll leave Faye out of the equation for this evening and move on, because I think it's very interesting. You suffered greatly after you wrote this book, as far as people that were in Hollywood, your career possibilities and so on, people really ostracized you because of this book, isn't that true? To some people did, and I think that uh, it was a little bit uh, lacking in, in uh, uh, sincerity because most people in Hollywood knew exactly what went on in our house. I had been in, in the business as an actress for 14 years. They knew what she had done to me and, and in trying to prevent me from earning a living. That was very well known in the adult years as well as what had happened uh, as when I was a child. And then, of course, I went to boarding school with people from the Hollywood community, so they and their friends and their parents all knew. So I think that it was, it was a little bit of, a, well, it was a lot of blaming the messenger for the very bad news. But then, of course, there was a whole different uh, audience and, and uh, impact from the book that really, really, really helped in changing some, some laws to protect children and to get people help 
that had suffered from various forms of family violence. And so I tend to focus on that, and that is the, the truly lasting legacy, I think. very active, I, I understand it, in adoption reform as well. Could you talk well, a little bit about that? There's, uh, uh, briefly, because uh, th there's a lot of work to be done. My brother and another uh, boy that was brought to the house and the two younger uh, siblings, we were all actually bought. We were people that were bought and paid for on a market that still exists. And except for myself, I don't believe any of the other ones were actually legally adopted. When uh, she, uh, Mother was uh, starting this idea of adopting children, uh, primarily, I'm afraid, because of her career, which has been explained uh, many times after she um, uh, was labeled box office poison, uh, it, it, it really was uh, almost a tragedy for her, but she needed something positive uh, for the fan magazines. And she went to the county social services agency and actually applied to be uh, qualified as an adoptive parent. And they turned her down as an unfit candidate. <laughs> so the agency did try to protect whoever the children might be that she had an interest in. So she just went around to the black market and bought children. and. My feeling is that that needs to be addressed. I, I just feel very strongly that that should have been um, uh, abolished when they also abolished slavery. But uh, having said that, the most important thing is that the, that the adoptive person has the same civil rights as any other citizen of the United States, and that is simply not true today. So I'm hoping that over the course of time, we can work on that and raise the consciousness so that other people, if they want to find their families or if they need medical information, they can actually get it without having to spend a fortune on lawyers and court costs and documentation simply to get their medical history. Uh, that just shouldn't be. Is it true that my... Your applause, unforgivable. Is it true that Meyer Lansky helped arrange your adoption? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, my we know you know who Meyer Lansky is. He's like one of the great mafia, the only Jewish mafia don. <laughs> <laughs> my understanding is that since she could not adopt in the state of California, that because of her connections from Chicago and Detroit when she was a dancer, a teenage dancer in the nightclubs, and also in New York where she was a dancer and she danced at, as a, a dancer at Roseland Ballroom. And uh, she met uh, the people that ran the nightclubs and became lifelong friends. So when she couldn't go through the normal channels, she went back to those friends and asked for their help. And that's why I was taken to Las Vegas, Nevada to be adopted in 1940. And then we drove across the country for reasons that I never did understand until this information came to me, to Miami, Florida, where she paid tribute to her benefactor to show him the prize. Wow. Um, and you were too young to remember it would have been But the reason I know that that's true is the first film I ever did happened to be on location in Miami, uh, Florida, and a newspaper woman came to interview me uh, while we were shooting the film, and she told me that the first time she had met me was when I was a baby, and uh, my mother and I had come to Miami, uh, and she gave me the year, and uh, that she, my mother never explained why, why we were there, and then from there we went up to New York.
Now that would have been a great Jean Crawford film. Um, we are running into the movie time, but I, last night when we had dinner, you uh, spoke with, I thought, great sincerity and great interest about one of your agendas tonight, and one of reconciliation, and I was wondering if you would expound on that a little bit. Well, I think you said in the in the beginning before uh, we got a chance to to sh talk and, and share here that uh, I have I have never done this before, and yet I have heard the stories, of course, heard the jokes, and I I thought that with the. 20th anniversary edition of, of the book, it was time that we all met and... <laughs> and could share some love and laughter at the holidays. And raise money for a very good cause, Project Open Hand. Yeah. And we have one just going for this. We have a surprise that Christina actually made. Yes, but I don't know to whom it goes. Mark has to help me. <laughs> Martha Stewart, I am not. <laughs> but I did my best. Okay, everybody needs to look under their seats. There are two red uh, bows under seats, and those two people are the lucky winners of the prize that will doubt to ensue.